Welcome to this talk. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little anecdote. Uh, if you have seen this movie called uh, Hancock, there's this scene where you know a guy is trying to uh, sell his idea to a pharmacy company, and uh, so the pharmacy company has a really innovative drug, okay, which uh, they think will make a lot of money. And then there's this guy who is coming and telling them you should give that drug away for free, right? And everyone sitting in that room is like dumbstruck. They are thinking, is this guy crackpot? I mean, we want to make money and he's telling us to give it away for free. So, uh, in a sense, what I'm trying to tell is, uh, you know, you have this data which you think is very sacrosanct, your client data which you think is like a wall which is uh, kind of protecting your business to you know uh, help you get more business and it's like what is most important for your business and what we are trying to uh, do in this talk is to try to convince you to expose this data so that people can benefit you can build more experiences and it will be a better world uh, so primarily uh, the uh, there are two parts to it where first we try to convince you that you should try to expose your data and the second is we'll talk about techniques of how you can do it easily, you mean with a few days or a, a few weeks of effort. So that's the two <coughs> halves that we are going to try to cover. Just a bit of a background, uh, I'm Pradeep and she, Suprita will be uh, trying to go over the slides that we have. Uh, we, uh, we work with a startup called WW Stay. We are into travel where you know we help people book their uh, hotels and apartments so one of the problems that we'll look at is you know uh, let's say uh, somebody wants to plan his vacation or a holiday and uh, we have a website which already does it but we want to you know expose it in the form of an api so that somebody else could probably build a mobile app or he could build a native uh, desktop application, what you will, using these APIs. So, uh, like I said, uh, this is the agenda for this session. We could keep it interactive, you know, where you could interrupt me anytime and if you think something is stupid or does not make sense, then just stop me. But broadly, we will cover about, you know, why uh, the data that you have, while it's very valuable, is uh, could be more useful if you actually let others access it. And we'll talk about what are some of the good practices when you want to expose this data how, uh, and how to do it, like what libraries do you use, what techniques, what are the uh, most important principles that are obviously uh, not all the detail is covered but the most important components that you need to build such a system so what do I mean by an API for this talk when I mean when I use the uh, word API it means that I'm talking about a HTTP or a HTTPS endpoint I'm not talking about a library or, you know, uh, some class which you expose uh, to your clients. That's fine, but for this talk, I'm talking specifically about something which is available in a browser or in a uh, terminal, if you will, and it works over HTTP or HTTPS. It returns JSON and XML. I think we more or less... Uh, most APIs work like this and the APIs are restful it's not really necessary but it's a good thing a good practice to use uh, restful APIs <laughs> right so uh, the big question is uh, do you kind of agree that you know you have data which is very important but it's useful to also expose it i mean do you, does anybody have any thoughts about this or do you think it's very natural that you know everybody just exposes their data or 
have you had any thoughts about this discussions where you go and tell your manager you know that whatever data we have we should let everybody else see it uh comments thoughts Okay. 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 So you think it makes sense only? Yeah, it makes sense only for established companies and not for say a startup which is just three or four member team, right? Or which does not more about established companies or anything. It depends on the use case that in which you are. Probably, and in Mumbai there is a bloodcam, you know, their complete website including their travel destinations everything so it depends on the use case in which you want to expose your data sure expose your api sure uh, so not all uh, not all data needs to be exposed but probably majority and definitely not what uh, the way the, probably your boss portrays where you, where he says no nothing can be shown to the outside world everything is you know sacred but uh, okay so when you expose your data right for instance uh, you have these startups uh, like uh, startups like what's it called uh, stripe for instance so uh, uh, has anybody you know integrated with payment gateways uh, sure right and has anybody enjoyed that experience oh really wow okay <laughs> oh it's a nightmare right tell you yeah i mean if you are doing it with stripe it's definitely enjoyable but if you have used any of these older ones i tell you it's a nightmare they have uh, libraries which you know you they want you to host third party code on your servers and uh, it does not play well with your infrastructure their support does not answer questions it's a nightmare uh but if it was an api then you know you would not have these kind of restrictions uh i as a developer would be free to use not the entire world is you know java or a php right uh people are programming in newer languages so the world has moved on and uh these apis will help you capture new customers okay uh and it's not completely we already have empirical evidence that this is true for instance startups like you know uh, stripe or shopify uh, even twitter and facebook for that instance i my my hypothesis is if they did not have these apis i really doubt twitter or facebook would have been as successful as they are today okay and the other reason why it is so important is you know it helps you to keep your design modular and this is something we always have to strive for uh because modular design helps you evolve fast uh there's less maintenance these are really corporate assets that you can leverage so uh and how does an a just the thought of trying to expose something as an api make it modular because you need to strip off so many components which are very specific or probably not well thought through for it to be useful to other people let's say you have a booking engine right where you want to book a hotel and you have a ton of stuff probably you have you think that it depends on uh, register users to use it at that point or uh, it may be dependent on your payment gateway for instance but that's not really needed at that point so when you try to just expose it as an api it brings a modular component to it which is very very useful so just and then this drives other uh, factors like you could build experiences or others could build experiences because everybody understands http and you know https json so uh, people could build native mobile app Uh, experiences 
desktop applications. Right, so now that we have got that out of the way where we agree that, you know, we want to expose our data as APIs, uh, so what, what do we, what should we do to get a good API? They should be easy to learn in the sense that uh, you don't have to spend too much, you don't want people to read through your entire manual. So if you do it right, just by looking at your API, you should be able to figure out what is the kind of data you would uh, get, right? Easy to use. Some of these are obvious in the sense that the, this statement on the slide is obvious, so I'll just leave it at that. If Hard to misuse, easy to read. So, Sufficiently powerful to satisfy requirements is, you know, a way to, let's say you have a bunch of APIs and each of them should, you should be able to say, feed the result of one <coughs> to another. That is what I mean by powerful, right? Where you say, get me a bunch of hotels and then you say, for these hotels, let's do a booking. So you, it's like how probably you would do it in Unix where you know you could the uh, output of one could just be the input for another. So if you have your APIs designed properly, you could actually do that. Easy to evolve in the sense that uh, you could add uh, more functionalities, make it more rich, and your framework should allow you to do this easily. And how do we do it? So at this point, let's assume that you know you have a website, you have very interesting data that you want to just expose it to the outside world, right? And it's very easy. Uh, I'm, at this point, I'm going to assume that uh, people are using Python, uh, but I'm sure that will be equivalent to whatever uh, language you're using. So, like I said, the uh, scenario now is, you know, you have a website with very interesting uh, business case you're solving, you have some data that you want to show it to the outside world. So you don't have to, now to convert, what you have is you have some data in some form and you want to build an API out of it. So uh, typically in uh, Python or in Django applications, you could use these uh, libraries which are open source. And what it means is it just exposes your model to the outside world by way of API endpoints. OAuth is a big chunk. Suprita is going to talk about it. We'll demo the how we could use this. Uh, so we'll come back to this later. And then once you have the API, you want to tell this to the users that, hey, this is my documentation. Go read through this. And you know you could start building your, uh, start using your APIs. And even this is very easy. Like in Python, people use things. So uh, I'm sure there are equivalents to this. So. Uh, hi all, I'm uh, Suprita. Um, I will be talking about OAuth, which stands for Open Authorization. Um, so as you can see, this, uh, this is the official definition that they have. We'll just go over the main terms in this. So first is, it says that it is an open protocol. Uh, so what do you mean by an open protocol? That it is defined by a standard body, which says that, which gives a clear guideline and what how the steps are to be used which shows that how one, if one wants to implement OAuth how it has to be done and um, these so the first thing this I believe secure authorization are the two most important words in this definition uh, secure being that uh, what happens is in this so the application that the is built using the service provider like this Facebook so we all build apps on Facebook so the app really does not come to know the user credentials like the username or the password that this person is registered with on Facebook which makes it a very secure thing the passwords are just not exposed to the uh, application that is built authorization permission to access data which means that um, so, for example, if you say that I just want to show my photos and my statuses, it will be only that. 
इट कैन नॉट पोस्ट अ स्टेटस ऑन योर बिहाफ और डू एनी सच एक्टिविटी सो ऑथराइजेशन इज यू बेसिकली यू वेन वर यू से दैट यू नो यू कैन यू से ओके आई गिव ऑथराइजेशन टू दिस एप सो इट हैज़ ए लिस्ट ऑफ थिंग्स विच इट सेज दैट ओके इट कैन एक्सेस योर स्टेटस इट कैन एक्सेस योर लाइक्स सो दैट इज वॉट वॉट इज ट्राइंग टू दिस इज द प्रॉब्लम दैट वॉट इज ट्राइंग टू सॉल्व so we'll just first look at the high level overview of how oauth works uh, first we'll start off with the actor so there are three main parties in uh, oauth uh, first is the uh, end user of course we who are going to use it then there's the consumer application and the service provider so to put it in simple terms the data is all stored on the service provider like all your tweets or your statuses your photos your likes your retweets direct messages everything is stored on the service provider application is something which is like how pradeep said right you're building experiences on the service provider so that happens uh, so consumer application is that so this can be built by any other third person by uh, anybody outside so when you expose your apis people will use the apis to build the consumer application third is the end user data so here i have taken an example of twitter tweetpick and uh, uh, the user so tweetpick what we all know tweetpick right so it is used to share photos and videos on twitter uh, so this this is the first flow of it where the user says expresses interest in using the consumer app he'll say hey i want to get some data or post data to twitter through this app so uh, so that is the first workflow that you see request to access data now tweet pick gets talking to twitter where he says that okay so this person wants to access my data can you please authenticate this person for me i have i don't know who this person is uh so then twitter gets talking to the end user that is there so this is what happens so when twitter starts talking to the end user there are two steps that happens in this first is authenticate so first you say that i am so and so so you enter your username and password which is authentication and then you authorize app so that was what i was telling before authorize app means that uh permissions that you will grant to this application is authorizing the app uh so once you do that twitter communicates back to tweet pick saying that okay this is a, this is a person so and so you can now go ahead and give them the data uh okay so now that was a very high level overview of how it works but internally there is uh more that takes place so that it can be more secure so what happens is when the end user tells the consumer application before all that what happens is when the consumer has to uh, register his application with facebook so what happens we all like if you want to build an app we go to facebook and say that this is a name for our app and we provide the details the result of which we will get a consumer key and secret for any app this is the method so first you go and register your app then secondly that is when the application becomes available for the end user to use now um so what happens is the consumer application requests for a token i will i will show you a demo next so this will become much more clear once i show the demo so there is a series of steps that takes place so the consumer application says that hey twitter can you give me a request token so whatever twitter will return will be an unauthorized token because the person he doesn't know who the person is it is not an authenticated or an authorized token once this workflow takes place where he is authenticated and authorized he it is then exchanged for an access token so typically what happens is every user is associated with an access token every user has to have an access token correspondingly in the consumer application so
so he will say he will store the con uh, access token and then let you share the data so every time you for example log in so many times we don't log into facebook right it is just that we open facebook and it's there so how this is is the access token is stored in the session it is there so every time we access it it it's a one time thing this is just a one time thing so once we get the access token it is then stored by this consumer application which will help you uh, access the data mul multiple number of times in the future okay i'm going to show a demo which will make it more clear are there any questions at this point? yeah I mean, is there something you Yeah, so see, like for example, we will take the example of Twitter, okay? I want to build an application on Twitter, which will tell me the number of followers, number of followers I got today and the number of people who unfollowed me today. For this, I have to go and register with Twitter, which will verify my website, which will verify the name of the app should be unique. And I will also say when the person uses this app, these are the permissions that I will ask for. Okay, so once this is done, then the Twitter will give me a consumer key and secret, which is with respect to each and every app that you register. Okay, now that is done. Just Probably explain it in the example. Yeah, okay, I'll just show this thing through the example. Okay, so now in this case, instead of Twitter, we have our own, so we are going to expose our data. So WW Stay is the service provider, like so let's, let me put WW Stay as Facebook for example. Okay, so people are going to build apps using our data. Okay, so then, so I'm going to put here something like how I'm going to put, so let me say, bar camp app so i'll just say so description of an app this is a test app so the callback url is after it successfully authenticates authenticates means that it should uh, once the username and password of the user is correct like i enter as an end user once it is correct the url it should hit back after authentication is the callback URL. I'll just give a random thing right now. And these are the resources. So we are, we being a travel company, we have these resources. So we have booking data, hotel data, where we have various hotel, uh, where we have booked in uh, and invoice data. So for example, I will say that this app will require me to have booking data and hotel data. So once I do this and I say create an app, so this you can see I get a consumer key and secret. This is the first step to creating any app. Okay, so then I'll get started with the flow. So we'll, we'll do this side by side so that it becomes little clear. Okay, so now, so now this step has been done where the client where the end user says I want to use an app. The app is this WSTAY OAuth client flow. We'll just take this for an example. This as an example. Uh, the this consumer application has asked has asked WWSTAY to give an unauthorized request token and this is what is displayed here. So this is the unauthorized request token. Are you guys following or am I going too fast? It's fine, okay. Um, so this is the unauthorized request token. So now this is the authentication part. That's what I meant like. So in uh, Facebook or something, you'll enter your username and password. So we have our own username and password that we provide. So for example, I have something like a demo travel manager. So this person, demo travel manager, has this booking data, uh, hotels data in our system, which we are going to expose to him. Okay. Yeah, 
so now once i finish authenticating this this is the authorization step now here you will have a list of permissions so you can have something like this person uh, this app is going to post on your behalf so this is the authorization step that takes place so you say authorize access so this is the data that you get so if you can see here see these are the number all the bookings that this is under this person so this for example can be taken equivalent to your timeline where you have a set of tweets or something like that so in this case it is a number of bookings so and i'm storing at this point i have an access token which is stored in the session i'm going to access this so here if you see i've got this thing called as 133 okay so the booking is under my when i say 133 it's going to show me those bookings now if i have something for example so i have 133 i don't have 135 under my uh, name like i logged in with demo travel manager that is not so that booking is under so when i say 135 no oh, i just want so i'll say something like so it will be like this this booking is there but it is not under mine like it is not under the name of demo travel manager that i have logged in through so that is the authorization part where you know you are only allowed to access you are only allowed access to resources for which uh, yeah which are allowed to buy so this means that it is restricted access see you are doing access at various levels you can really control what data you want to expose and to whom an equal and to auth may be a simple username and password there are two disadvantages of this first of all if a third party application wants to build that person will also know the username and password because the uh, person will log into the application but in auth that disadvantage is not there and second thing is this that you can control the data that you want to expose at various levels does this flow make little more sense now see the callback url is see that means that once i authenticate now like i say uh, you enter your login details for example for twitter after you hit authenticate it's the callback url that is there so as yes. an application you would want it to uh, hit that url after authentication no i am using a different uh, uh, different consumer key in secret right now but it would do that i mean yeah that's not a issue yeah you want to say something yeah just wanted to add that you know at that point the uh, a handler is actually your service provider which in here would be this you know so at at that level uh, twitter.com is actually checking if this person is uh, authenticated so and when he is happy when uh, your service provider is happy that uh, allow this user to go through then he is going to give back the control to your app right which is what the callback url is basically so it's a way of saying when you are done and you are happy let me know and i'll take it forward from there oauth is a protocol which is defined by a standard uh, you have different implementations of it uh, you want to yeah so there is so in what we are talking about is oauth 1.0 revision a so there is oauth 2.0 also but they have not yet released a stable draft of that do facebook and you know uh, twitter also i think have tried their hand at over 2.0 but the most stable version is over 1.0 and this is the workflow for that yeah they actually released over no draft but it is so broken yeah it's, yeah like the last yeah. week you know this there been a lot of uh, talk about uh, twitter that's why hasn't been shifted so i was actually one of the first here in fact i don't I think, think there is agreement among the committee no, members on the law uh, what is really uh, so i was working on yeah. 1.8 uh, uh, okay. uh, the spec uh. and uh, he is actually left yeah erin right and yeah left, and i was like okay so this means i'm going to be using to if he believes that uh, that's not secure enough the same thing which uh, i think someone asked about the call that so that's the most insecure part right now the reason is because on a 
you've heard about exercise and stuff. So yeah. someone's feeling a session. So that's mm -hmm. the in insecure part in the work too, which is why you specify a callback so that nobody else can misuse. Because when you're giving the data access, you don't want somebody else to steal that and you know get it through. That's that's what callback actually helps you. Yeah. So then you have the domains in the callback. To yeah. Make it a lot in fact, there was even an exploit recently on yeah, Facebook was, uh, where they exploited, the you know, the that, yeah, over two implementation of like, I think uh, you're using some sort of a library, right? I saw the CSRF token being passed around. That's what yes. people were doing, and then yeah. Yeah. trying to come up with a. So, so they all have different uh, implementation because I'm actually doing a startup where we are using data from all different sources. So I've worked with 50 different services. So they all have different different versions of their own. What's spec? Okay, okay. It's a spec, but yeah. nobody agrees with it. <laughs> except I think Twitter is the only one which is stable because they're using the 1A. I think yes. they're using 1A as well, right? Yes. Yeah, 1.0A, yeah. So it has to be there. So it has to be there. No, no, fetch data is again API. This is just authentication part. So API, like he initially started off saying, why do you need API and why do you need to expose? like. We, although we are using API from different services, we also have our own internal API for you know whatever we want to expose it. It doesn't have to be public itself. Now I think he talked about the blood group and mm -hmm. the transit in San Francisco, which is a public API. Anybody can use, yes. you don't need authentication. Yeah. When you're dealing with private data, like even all your Facebook apps are taking information, mm -hmm. which of course that's tried as much as possible to misuse because they keep, they ask for all kinds of information. So the idea that OAuth is trying to make it easy for developers to actually plug into existing services, like Twitter also became popular. They were they had only 40%, when I was doing apps for them, uh, they had 40% traffic through web, and I don't think 60% were through apps. Apps, yeah. Now, of course, they don't like developers yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's it's the other way around now. Yeah, interesting. In fact, uh, the Twitter was down a uh, few, uh, mm. for a while, and actually it survived because even though the uh, front end was down, people could still go to Twitter using their apps, right? And they actually, a large population of Twitter users didn't in, in fact even notice the outage because uh, the APIs were working fine and you could actually get to the APIs using your mobile and other uh, <laughs> applications you have installed. So definitely think about, you know, how you want to expose your data and try to leverage on these technologies. So if you actually see uh, what is implemented by many uh, big companies, in fact, you name it and they're using what uh, for exposing their APIs. Um, yeah, we'll go over why they, it is so important. So first being that distributed services. So what I mean by that is uh, like, for example, we have like Google contacts, right? I will not store Google con now I want to build an application on Google contacts where I want to import all the contacts of the particular person. I don't have to store the username and password of that person and all the data and things like that. I just need very specific. I, I, I don't want to get into the details of who this person, only the data that I need, I will just fetch it for that person and uh, it'll be there. So, and we are all moving towards distributed services, I feel. Uh, Yes, that's what I mean. That brings us to the second point: that password storage thing, where uh, the application built on the uh, service provider need not know the user credentials. Secure and ease of use. We just saw that, right? I mean, when authentication and authorization, that is what this is. And from an end user perspective. He just does not, I mean, they don't come to know all this that is happening. At the same time, whatever rights he's saying, okay, I give these permissions, only that will happen. It cannot go out of that uh, boundary. Uh, granular administration, that means that there is application level authentication. So uh, this happens when a consumer app is registered. So at any point of time, if uh, if they feel that the app is not secure or you know it, it has been hacked or anything, they can always revoke the rights given to the app. Whereas the persons can still uh, use like for example, any app built on Twitter and that app goes down or something like that the person's user credentials will still, still be the same and they can use Twitter. Implementation, yeah, OAuth has been implemented in many different languages. 
uh, it requires some time to understand the flow but uh, it can be done there are there's a lot of uh, data out there many people who have actually done it so it should not be much of a problem and pradeep would like to take yeah so just to you know recap what we uh, discussed today we looked at why it is important to expose your data uh, how your business could leverage on that uh, we saw about what are the techniques to do it uh, what are the good practices to expose your data and then we looked at how you could do it in a using just a few simple uh, libraries that is there right uh, that's about it so perhaps you can also attend you know i believe there's a tech clash tech clash session where they are going to talk about a much much more easier way where you just host your say web application on heroku and expose it using apis it's just out of the box it's like you know you just if you have your service there you get it for free it's like a free meal so you should attend this if you found this talk interesting so questions comments we don't have a twitter example but uh, Oh. session hijacking is you can do uh, uh, xss because your callback url you have right so that always gets uh, passed your cookie so you could then hijack your session uh, if it's not properly done No, the first time you launch Quick Pick, right? He will check if there's an access token, and if it's not there, he will say, "Give me a request token." Quick Pick will tell. That's why the arrows are pointing clearly, right? Quick Pick will say to Twitter, "Give me a request token." The arrow pointing towards Twitter means Quick Pick is sending a request to Twitter. Okay, it is requesting a token. Yes. and twitter says okay take this unauthorized token right and so then tweet pick needs to exchange that unauthorized token to a access token which is authorized authenticated and which has what permissions you have so then it's going to say please authorize this token this arrow here first this request token is just given the tweet pick you will have a no we have not come to the point yet are you clear up to this point you say give me a token he says uh, this is your unauthorized token request the token this guy has to send the customer card no yeah he has to give me yeah quick pick has to apart to the url on twitter this is the consumer no at this point registration has already happened yeah registration has happened that is this user has already Not user, even cons. That fellow has registered. Tweet pick. Ah, yeah. Tweet pick has registered this app. Yeah. Twitter, yeah. Twitter has got the account. Yeah. Will that only is requesting the token? Yes. Give me a fact token for. Not correct. It's saying give me any token. I'm going to allow the user to authorize. Yeah. see that token is just like you said it's just to which identifies that token only identifies your app here ha 
okay, this token identifies only the app. Okay. You want a token which identifies the app and the user. Hmm. That's why you want an access token. So first time you are saying you identify the app and then Twitter accepts and saying you are a valid app. Yes, he is saying okay, you are a valid app and you can use this token. Okay, with that, it will, okay, it's an access token, he has to send it access. No, the access token comes after you do all this, this part of the response. So, you, you got this point where you say you give me a request token and you exchange this. Uh -huh. That yeah. part is clear? That is correct. That is correct. Okay. First you are authenticating only your author, you are uh, your application. <coughs> The application is not authenticated. Twitter. So that's when you enter your login details. That is the login screen you see. Okay, where you say login here and then when you log in you say this application wants to post on your behalf or something. Okay, if you say yes, then he is going to give you this access token. If you get the access token, then you are kind of that's assuming that the Twitter has authenticated the data. And then you will probably start showing the content. Then how about managing the authorization of that? That is to verify who the customer is, right? True. Authentication is fine. Uh, you said authorization, you can control the data minute level. Yeah, he has to do that. So if you say that you No, that you are doing it. No, no, why when she you types on 155, she's got the message that you are not authorized to the data. That's a data level she is authorizing. Whether this guy can see this. See, authorization will come into picture if it tries to access resources, the app will try to access resources which are not authorized for. Okay, we'll take Twitter for example. If it can access only my tweets, it should not be able to access my direct messages. That's what authorization means. So, when this person registers initially with Twitter, it asks, it says that I need these permissions. I will ask only for tweets. I won't ask for direct messages. So, for example, I will not uh, grant the authorization to post. You cannot post data on my behalf. You can only read data what is there. You cannot post a tweet on my behalf. That is an authorization. No, no, no. no. That is just consumer key and secret is consumer point. The data is of the user, so the user will control what he wants to show and what he doesn't want to show. Here you are data. Yeah, so it can be applicable to any, I mean, it depends on the kind of data you have. Can be applicable to yeah, this is mostly for us. Like see, in my case, doing and we do the data, not on the Twitter. No, there is no data stored on the computer app. That's the point. It is only stored locally. If you have used Twitter or any Twitter app, no, the data is on the other. Yeah. So we typically have a start communicating so that's it. Yeah. So we take, for example, we take free text. Free text, free text, right? So if you get hundred dollars, you want to book a hotel in the They impose your interest. So you know, make my prayer for. Basically, it says that it will allow you to post statuses on your Facebook timeline. So if I say yes, then I should not have an objection. Sure. So, for example, we pick, can post a photo on my behalf. You can have and they're bad and Okay. Whereas there might be another app which can post the data. So, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that is the point. 
It's not possible. It's asked to post on my behalf.